good evening friends uh, for few it might be good morning and uh, good afternoon according to the time zone i'm your host piali uh, back with uh, another webinar and another speaker today we have uh, mr sunil mundra with us who is an international speaker and a publishing author as well sunil has worked globally in consulting with enterprises aspiring to enhance agility and embrace change and now sunil is uh, working with thoughtworks as a principal consultant and today uh, sunil has a very interesting topic to talk about that is uh, treating organization as a living system an enabler for enhancing agility where sunil will uh, suggest some of the actionable guidelines that will help leaders to bring their organizations to life quite interesting it is uh, welcome to the webinar sunil and uh, i would request you to take the session forward hi piali uh, hello all the uh, joinees uh, to the webinar i really appreciate appreciate you taking time out i know it's late in india but wherever you are uh, you know appreciate that you've taken time out to uh, to to join the webinar and uh, you know hear me out on this topic um so uh, let's just delve straight away pli has already done my introduction so i'm not going to talk more about myself but let's get to the topic straight away which is treating the organization as a living system and enabler for enhancing agility uh, and and just to um, Uh, uh just to highlight the importance of topic uh this is at the core uh of my book uh on enterprise agility which is going to come out at the end of june beginning of july um so you know this concept i is 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 a critical concept in my book and you know i am happy to share uh that with you at this stage itself all right so i want to make a confession um uh, so when we are examining living systems uh, or complex systems and complex city science is based on multiple underlying sciences like biology physics uh, sociology etc etc i am not an expert at those sciences uh, and that's what i want to confess what i my specialty is is in terms of understanding how organizations work uh but i have studied complex systems enough to draw some inferences for organizations but if you ask me about the underlying sciences uh which which uh, comprise complexity science then i am definitely not an expert i am a learner uh and it's a long uh, learning journey but i continue to, i will continue to uh travel on that journey to enhance my knowledge as well having said that let's begin with this topic um so does anyone know who this person is you can guess it i'm not i know you uh, you know i won't be able to hear you you're all in listen only mode but this person is uh, is the uh, uh ceo of nokia and uh, i guess let me just see what happened uh, right is steven alep ex ceo of nokia and these are the words that he said uh when nokia was being handed over to microsoft you know in that ceremony and he and many nokia employees had tears in their eyes so not too long ago before microsoft acquired nokia nokia was as we all know or would have tracked that it was the leading cell phone company in the world they selling phones in large volumes and when apple came up with the ipod and with all the apps you know that would be loaded on that etc the multiple reasons and nokia somehow suddenly got left behind and lost relevance within a very very short period of time and i think this this uh, statement that we didn't do anything wrong but somehow we lost is a reflection of uh, the frustration which many leaders are facing today so it's not about doing anything wrong it's about doing the things right which are needed to deal with fast paced change and nokia lost relevance primarily because of fast paced change the other example is kodak um which was a absolute blue chip at one point in time and suddenly digital cameras cell phones with cameras came and kodak had to file for bankruptcy 
it is very interesting that the original digital camera or the concept of the digital camera was invented by Kodak. Uh, but they felt uh, that the results were not very good and this is not going to take off. They didn't even care to file a patent for it. And look how it came back to bite them um, very hard, leading to uh, you know the collapse of uh, of the organization itself and their business model completely. So what is happening today? Organizations are struggling to survive, right? Uh, no organization, regardless of their size, regardless of how old they are, regardless of how well entrenched they are can take their survival for granted today. Organizations which are blue chips at one point in time suddenly losing value. I mean, if you look at uh, the companies which uh, which had highest brand value maybe 10, 20 years ago, they have been replaced uh, by the likes of Google, Amazon, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, which are new age companies and which are leveraging technology uh, and also structuring the organizations in a way to deal effectively with change and this is happening because you know the ch pace of change is so fast uh, and organizations essentially are not modeled uh, you know to deal with fast pace of change if you look at uh, you know organizations 20 30 years ago uh, or the period before uh, the information era came in, uh, the mandate to the leaders was to maintain stability and predictability, right? Change was something which had to be controlled uh, and, and uh, you know, leaders were rewarded on maintaining status quo or changing at the pace at which, you know, the, the board of directors or the leaders decided to what extent they wanted change. Basically, it was resisted and it was controlled. But now uh, there is no choice. Uh, the environment is changing so fast that business cannot control the extent of change. And if they don't change themselves, they're going to fall behind very, very quickly. Businesses are dealing with uh, unprecedented circumstances, right? So we are looking at so many new disruptions which are coming because of technology. Uh, you know, now we are talking of artificial intelligence, machine learning right now. Who knows what that's going to lead to in terms of product offerings, in terms of how the organization operates, etc. Right. So, for example, uh, you know, Facebook uh, had, you know, two robots uh, talking to each other and they began speaking in English and they went into a language which was gibberish or which sounded at least gibberish to human beings. Uh, and and they started communicating in a completely different language which you know we can't understand and facebook in the panic mode they shut those robots off uh, but to me that is really uh, you know a, a a indicator of things to come in terms of how suddenly an unprecedented circumstance comes in uh, and you have to uh, you have to relook at your business model completely like, for example, blockchain is coming in. Now, that is going to make a difference once it, it gets into uh, mainstream mode. Uh, it's going to revolutionize banking, right? Because uh, the, the, the way um, the traceability of transactions happen, right? Uh, the possibilities are absolutely endless there. And there are so many examples, uh, you know, of domains merging, uh, you know, of, of, of technology coming in with, with newer and newer things that enterprises are going to have to deal with unprecedented circumstances and the last problem is that yeah, as i mentioned earlier the uh, the impact of the environment you know the uh, enterprises are not able to isolate themselves from that anymore and it is going to impact organizations whether they like it or not so if the organizations are not proactive uh, it's it's they have no control over how this impact is going to be on them and most often somebody else will take the competitive advantage away uh, and and the organization you know will be hit hard uh, and hit hard in a very bad way so the conclusion is that complexity um, is 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 very very high in today's business environment and uh, we we have to be adoptable as enterprises as leaders to ensure that uh, we deal with this complexity 
Now, the challenge is most organizations are struggling to deal with complexity, as I said, because the previous eras did not have so much complexity. They had a lot of stability. Um, you know, things were moving at a much slower pace in the business environment. Actually, you know, in the times of industrial revolution, the main challenge for organization was how can they produce more because the demand for, from consumers was insatiable. Uh, and the problem there was production capacity, enhancing production capacity. Today, that's not a problem at all. Today, you know, entry barriers have collapsed. You know, somebody can just start a new business. So there is a bank uh, in, in Germany called N26. It's a mobile only bank. Uh, and, and they just started with very frugal uh, resources uh, in terms of people and money. Uh, and usually a core banking system for if a bank which is having physical branches, etc. Uh, anybody from the banking sector would know it costs a core banking implementation costs anywhere between 80 to 100 million dollars. It is purported that N26 bank build whatever uh, software they needed to operate because they're only a mobile only bank in a few thousand dollars. That's it. Okay. And if you are a customer of the bank and you know they have some criteria though. Uh, you can open a bank account within six minutes. That's all that you need and some verification etc that needs to be done you know that that happens later which is outsourced so really uh, you know there are these enterprises which are taking advantage of this complexity uh, but there are others who are just unable to change and i don't know what's going to happen in the banking scenario uh, you know because of this bank coming in and you know if there are a few banks like this coming out uh, you know they might just disrupt uh, the existing banking models so the so what got me thinking uh, through my consulting work is that uh, enterprises today are dealing, uh, you know, finding it hard to deal with complexity, but complexity is not new to us. All right. Uh, and this was an aha moment for me when I realized that complexity has been around us forever uh, and uh, we have dealt with it very effectively, but uh, uh, organizations are struggling to deal with it. And that got me thinking what is the real problem right with organizations why can't organizations deal with complexity so when i say complexity is not new to us what do i mean here are some examples of uh, what i call as, as naturalistic and socio-economic systems uh, which which have dealt with complexity since time immemorial you look at economy right it used to be barter earlier then it gone into a cash economy then we had credit cards and who knows now we are probably moving into cryptocurrencies or what we don't know right so as times are changing the economy has adopted and moved on you know earlier the economy is very local today it's completely global all that has happened right if you look at human beings in the lower uh, left quadrant you know we were apes earlier and then you can see the evolution uh, you know how how that has happened and we are still evolving and we are so apes then we, we became humans then we got into multiple races based on climates so africa has the black race uh, you know china etc has the yellow race europe america has a caucasian race we indians are asians and um, so how did that happen right we because we adapted to the uh, you know external circumstances which were changing uh, uh, you know we were able to evolve and survive if you look at traffic, I mean, earlier, what was the traffic? You know, it's just people walking around. Then maybe the wheel was invented. We probably had a bullock cart or something like that, right? Today, you know, there's cars moving on the road. Tomorrow, who knows, we might be having flying cars. And then we probably are going to have automatic uh, uh, cars without people. And all that is going to become part of traffic, right? If you look at jungles, um, I mean, again, as I said, right, I'm not an expert on this, but from what I've read, it seems that the trees which existed, uh, you know, in the pre-dinosaur era were so different from what the trees are existing now. And it's an ecosystem by itself. There are so many creatures, animals living there. They are all evolving. Even bacteria which lives there, you know, evolves uh, in, into, uh, you know, into a new state. Um, so flora, fauna, animals, anything which is living and is surviving and has survived for a long time, the survivability has been there only because we have been able to adapt ourselves to the complexity so so that led me to study of what is called as uh, complex adaptive systems and all these systems which uh, are living system and which are complex and which have adapted to change are categorized as complex adaptive systems or we'll just call them cas in short form for now okay so if you look at the cas model uh, 
what it is showing is uh, if you look at uh, in the center uh, in the lower part there are a few agents and uh, you know these agents are interacting with each other uh, and uh, you know there is external environment which is influencing the information coming in going out uh, agents are self organizing there is nobody directing them and then something emerges from there right and you know based on that emergence and how it it interfaces with uh, how the behavior goes out into the external environment and the feedback that comes in you get positive feedback you get negative feedback and then you adapt right so it's it's an influence and you know the the, the system is closely integrated with the external environment and constantly getting feedback and they're constantly adapting and interacting among themselves too uh, to be able to adapt and respond uh, to a changing environment right so in terms of cast characteristics and there are many but i have just taken a few in terms of understanding how living systems work and what really makes them adaptable and responsive to a complex environment first is that the agents are largely autonomous right so if you look at uh, uh, you know economy right you have for example if you look at a stock market you know people are autonomous people go there they transact uh, and transaction happens because uh, you know, they, they interact. So the agents interactions influence system behavior. So if there was no buyer or seller, obviously the system behavior is not going to be there at all. So the interaction between the agents is really, really important. Uh, so what happens, uh, you know, even, even, uh, even for example, when we are driving, the interaction is because we are watching other cars, we are watching other signals and we are giving signals to other car drivers. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, the interaction is there through signaling there. Even as people, uh, the third point, right? Coherence around a purpose. So when we work, we work for an organization which has a purpose. Or when, you know, say for example, we join a social organization, there is a purpose. When we have a family and we come together and we stay together, there is a purpose. So agents really cohere around a purpose. Again, going back to the stock market, the purpose is to, you know, make money or build wealth or whatever that might be, right? Uh, so purpose is, is, is what is necessary for a, you know, agents to come together and which holds the agents together. The next bit is about emergence and, uh, sure you can know patterns, um, but you don't know at the next moment, uh, you know, what's going to happen. Like for example, tomorrow, what is the market index, you know, share market index going to be tomorrow? You never know, right? You know that people are going to buy and sell. You can probably have a trend, but you can, you are in no position to predict what the index level is going to be tomorrow. It is all based on emergence, right? You look at exchange rate of, of a currency, uh, you know, or, or you look at, for example, even a traffic jam, you don't know when an accident can happen or when a just a jam can happen. Uh, yes, you know that there are peak hours and the traffic is heavy, but you cannot predict the exact moment where and when a jam can happen, right? It's all emergence. And the last bit is, is that, you know, they evolve. And, and that's, that's really the key uh, that, you know, they are sensing, these systems are sensing the external environment and they keep evolving, uh, you know, so that they can keep up with the external environment and, and be in sync with that as much as they can be, right? Um, so uh, the the intrinsic attribute you know which best enables uh, to, to to you know the for the system to change is really agility right i'm sorry i couldn't find a better picture i'm sure few of you are uh, you know probably smiling looking at this uh, but uh, there was no better picture that i could look at and my creativity is a little bit limited you know in terms of uh, finding uh, you know great pictures but yes agility is is really the key uh, why uh, you know these living systems are are able to uh, adapt to change and respond to change so effectively in a complex environment, right? Um, so uh, now, so do CAS have agility, and what do you mean by agility, right? There are a few characteristics which I want to point out, uh, which which define agility because again, it's a word which is not understood or misunderstood many times. First is the ability to sense the environment. Yeah, you've got to understand what's happening in the environment. Then it's the ability to adapt, you know, yourself and also the ability to respond. And they don't necessarily happen in the order which I have stated. Sometimes, you know, your adaptation might happen. Of course, sensing probably is important, but maybe you respond first and then adapt, or maybe you first you adapt and then you respond. I don't know how, how exactly that would work. That would depend from system to system. But my hypothesis is that complex adaptive systems, by definition, are able to sense, are able to adapt, and are able to respond. 
so at this point uh, i just want to do a check on uh, you know whether we have any questions uh, do we need any clarification about this concept uh, before we move on to understanding uh, what the implications for uh, you know enterprises and organizations might be if you know we are attempting to model them as cas uh, and bring life into them piali yeah just uh, let me check if we have uh, any question so uh, i can't see any question till now uh, okay no worries yeah yeah no worries. only one uh, response uh, i have uh, got uh, i am good dinesh is saying so i think we can uh, move forward yeah. all right no worries all right okay that's that's great that's great uh, okay so let's understand you know what are the implications uh, you know from from a leadership perspective uh, in in terms of bringing life into organizations okay so for leaders and and i have tried to uh, you know write this in 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 the way in which the agile manifesto is written so it doesn't necessarily always mean that uh, you know the 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 other variable in the pair is not at all important but something else becomes more important over that variable uh, and and leaders have to reorient themselves towards that so vuca uh, vuca stands for volatility uncertainty c obviously is for complexity and a is for ambiguity and i think that is the norm of today right the you know, all these four things are there in the business environment and i think leaders uh, you know should not be resisting this but seeing you know how they can adapt to this and actually how they can leverage this you know to to build competitive advantage um, and and this has to be given more precedence over predictability and stability uh, and i think uh, vuca really is the lifeline of a complex adaptive system because it would not survive uh, if you enforce predictability and stability on it so for example uh, you know just say that uh, you know you you by law or by some mechanism you try to bring in predictability into the market or stability into the stock market just imagine right so if you are saying oh i will only allow the index to rise 100 points no more right if you can if you enforce that kind of predictability uh, or try to reduce the natural variance which happen as part of you know the uh, the system operating uh, on its own the system will actually die right uh, even in our own lives right uh, say you know you are saying okay you have to eat exactly this every day exactly at this minute you have to do this you know even as a person you know we won't survive we'll be like zombies we'll be like you know uh, uh, you know lifeless people walking around if if predictability uh, and stability uh, is to be enforced again i repeat that it does not mean that predictability and stability are not important we need that to a certain level but i think it is important for uh, leaders to look at what is that variation uh, you know which we need to accept if we need to embrace vuca and how can we allow predictability and stability to emerge from the system itself uh, and respect you know that emergence of course if it is veering too much on one side or the other side uh you know then then leaders have to balance that so again one of the key characteristics of a cas is that it is on a fine line between order and chaos chaos and i think uh, you know my study says that it is only on that fine line when enterprises are that they are able to innovate and experiment and adapt so the the role of leaders is uh you know to allow for vuca but at the same time to ensure that predictability and stability uh, is emerging from the system you manage that and keep the keep these things in balance uh, uh, you know before uh, uh, you know even thinking about you know enforcing any of these things because it will destroy uh, you know the 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 life uh, in the organizations the second point is about guiding or directing um so a key property of a complex system is that if you want to if you want the system to behave differently um you have to you just have to nudge it or you you can put guidelines in place over there but you you can't direct uh, uh, you know everything and studies have shown that if if you direct too much uh, you know actually it 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 gets into major chaos and people have done studies on traffic uh, 
Uh, and again, you know, somebody has compared a uh, traffic situation with a lot of traffic lights all over the place uh, to say, uh, you know, self-organizing traffic in India where you say have a roundabout, uh, you know, and people just self-organize. And sometimes you look at a video of traffic passing through a roundabout without a traffic signal or even through a road intersection. You are actually surprised, you know, how people self-organize and, and the traffic moves faster. Uh, rather than if there was to be a signal sure if somebody breaks the rules uh, uh, or, uh, or makes an exception there is going to be an accident and, and that's one of the key things is that complex adaptive system have some basic rules which cannot be broken if, if you break them you know there will be disaster but at the same time you know you, you can just guide it uh, uh, you if you if you at every step if you direct it right it's actually going to slow down the system and, and take away that adaptability and, and responsiveness from the system. The third point is about effectiveness uh, over efficiency. So again, just to repeat, it is, efficiency definitely is important, but that cannot be your primary driver when your survival is at stake. And I think you need to be effective in terms of providing value to your customers. Uh, you need to be effective in terms of sensing the environment, adapting to it and responding to it. Efficiency is important, so obviously there should not be you know wasteful practices you should curb waste but you cannot optimize for efficiency when you are dealing with newer and newer and newer circumstances efficiency can be optimized when you are producing something in a repetitive way like for example in manufacturing because you're doing the same thing over and over and over and over again right you you repeat a process continuously and you produce thousands and lakhs and millions of units of you know a product you want to see how you can minimize um, you know the variation and get more efficient uh, while while you're doing that so i think applying the efficiency driver as a primary driver for something which is constantly moving and when you're dealing with innovation when you're dealing with experimentation when you need to take bets, uh, I think efficiency cannot be your primary driver. Effectiveness has to be, you know, your guiding principle. So if you have to choose, make a trade-off between effectiveness and efficiency, that trade-off has to be in the favor of effectiveness. Of course, while ensuring that there is no unnecessary waste in the system. The other leadership implication which uh, I want to call out is. Uh, you know technology awareness of a technology indifference and the reason why i'm saying this is technology is the core uh, or the primary reason why the environment is getting so badly disrupted today right and even most organizations are now embracing technology as their core uh, enabler for their competitiveness there are so many businesses would which would just not exist you know if there was if there was no technology or you know they just can't operate without and technology is is is, uh, is, is affecting all industries today i mean for i think somebody in ing bank said uh, uh, that that we are a technology company with a banking license and that's a profound statement you know for somebody from a bank to make and that's how even if traditional industry like banking can get impacted with technology then other industries for sure are but what I have experienced or I have seen is that uh, most leaders uh, who handle other functions other than the CTO or the CIO <clears throat> are not aware of the technological developments that happen or how technology is enabling or hindering their businesses. Board of directors many times don't have a single person who represents technology you know at the board of directors level so making those decisions making those trade-offs uh, you know having uh, conversations which uh, which which uh, are meaningful uh, are not happening you know in most enterprises so what sometimes happens is the CTO and the CIO become so powerful that you know because the other people are not able to challenge him or her they just have to follow him or her and maybe because it's a single person's perspective you know, uh, that person is not getting a wider perspective. That person may have biases. And all these things, you know, hamper an organization in terms of utilizing technology to leverage it to their best advantage. So I think that one of the key things which, and, and this technology awareness is about being close to your environment. Uh, and I think therefore, execs must make effort to at least understand what are the broad technology trends and what do they mean for business. Obviously, they need not 
get into specifics of a coding language or uh, you know a, 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 a specific uh, um, uh, technical language but i think how technology affects uh, the businesses and what are the trends in, emerging in technology i think execs need to make themselves aware of as a part of you know understanding the environment better the next is about systems thinking over reductionism uh, and, and, and a reductionism attitude actually comes from treating the organization as a machine or a closed ended system. It's like, OK, if if, uh, you know, a department is not performing well, I fix something in that department and, you know, it will not impact anything else. It's usually not like that. And that's why reductionism has led to creation of silos, uh, you know, in organizations uh, which create handoffs and which slow down the entire system. But I think if we are looking at, uh, you know, bringing life into the system, then we have to look at it from a systemic perspective as to how, you know, this whole organization, the whole value chain works from concept to cash. Right. Uh, and, and if we make a change somewhere, how it is going to impact something else across the organization also into the ecosystem? How does it impact the customer, et cetera? Execs need to broaden their mind rather than do silo based thinking or reduction based thinking. The next is about emergence over upfront detailed planning, right? And the key word is upfront and detailed. Of course, we need to plan. But the point is things are changing so fast. And this is, again, adhering to the agile principle of, uh, you know, uh, responding to change over following a plan. Uh, the responding to change has to happen based on emergence. So you can't dictate, you know, what what is going to come out of, uh, you know, emergence. It's like. Uh, I mean, if I have to give a simple analogy of 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 emergence, it's like uh, it's like mixing blue and uh, yellow, right? Once you mix those two colors, you get green, and you can't go back to the blue and yellow anymore, right? You have to deal with the green which has come up because that those things have got mixed. Similar as the example of black coffee and milk. I mean, you know, they had they have two different properties, but when they come together, yeah, it's a different drink. Uh, it's neither milk, it's neither black coffee. It's some it's some some variation of coffee which you have, right? Uh, and and it loses its basic properties. So what is happening is, uh, you know, as I said, right, a lot of things, uh, you know, emerge. You have to watch out for those patterns and trends and and deal with that. Um, the other implication is, you know, vulnerability over dominance, and this this becomes important for leaders because things are changing so fast. Uh, the leaders are not going to have all the answers to the problems which people are facing on the ground and uh, leaders can't dominate and say okay i know all the answers i'm telling you so you do it i think the people who have the best context are the people who are closest to the customers and who are closest to the ground and it's okay for the leader to say look i don't have the answer let's figure it out together involve people who are you know close to the ground and come up with an approach or a solution uh, you know, keeping an open mind about what people uh, on the ground might suggest and embrace that. But I think the key point here from a leadership perspective, which I think is a marked change from how leaders operated in a stable era, in a stable era, people looked up to the leaders to, you know, give directions uh, and, and, and they just worried about executing those directions. Uh, and if something went wrong, it was the leader's fault or the leader took accountability and responsibility because that decision was not made by them. I think, we, you know, in, in a complex environment, you cannot operate like that. It is people closest to the ground who are in the best position to respond to, to, to change. Uh, and, and, and therefore, you know, a leader has to uh, be vulnerable enough to say, I don't have all the answers and, and let's work it out together. The other important thing, you know, from bringing life into an organization is customer first over shareholders first, right? So shareholders first is a very inward thinking, uh, you know, mindset. Uh, so and this phenomenon actually, you know, emerged from the Wall Street in the 1980s, right? Uh, I think the movie Wall Street, uh, you know, not sure how many of you have seen that, but it's from my generation when I was very young, I've seen that movie. It said greed is good, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so, what is what was taught in business schools for many years is if what is the primary purpose of an organization? The primary purpose of an organization is to make money for shareholders or maximize shareholder wealth. Now, what's in it for the customer there, right? Uh, why should a customer worry about or you know buy something from an organization which cares 
more about its shareholders than about its customers i mean you see so many enterprises who are actually cutting corners when they are serving customers just to save cost just so that they can give a better return to the shareholders and they are making short term decisions at the cost of the customer just to show better profits you know for, uh, uh, to the share market you know on a every quarterly basis in fact you know and 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 i think you know customers first is part of responding to uh, the environment and adapting to the environment and um, i would take it one step further and say why do we treat customers as an external entity you know why can't we treat customers like an entity like an employee which means that why can't we engage with them more why can't we take them in confidence more why do we look at them as transactional right uh, so the way we build engagement with our employees why can't we build engagement with our customers uh, that's something for for leaders to think about so i think the key thing here is that we need to be a purpose driven organization uh, and of course the shareholder returns will follow if we serve our customers and make customers happy uh, you know with a purpose uh, and 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 then uh, the shareholders returns would would definitely come so uh, purpose over profit i think that 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 really again you know is the other way of uh, you know uh, saying this uh, this thing similar on similar lines uh, leadership you know need to engage with the different stakeholders rather than exploit and i think this exploitation mindset comes from uh, you know again the way traditional economics it looks like eh? land labor uh, you know capital uh, you know are treated as resources and even labor was treated as a resource so when you treat something as a resource and resources are meant to be exploited right i mean you you want to extract as much as you can out of them uh, but the point is when you exploit something and especially when you exploit people right the engagement is not there and we see so many organizations which exploit people right in in many subtle ways uh, uh, and i think that mindset is not a good mindset i think the mindset again again you know in terms of exploiting customers as well you know uh, what we are seeing is how can i cut corners how can i you know make maximum money for the customer without really value, uh, you know verifying whether that person or the customer is get deriving value and will they remain engaged so this exploitation mindset has to actually give away uh sure you should be you know exploiting your resources which are you know non people related uh but i think when it comes to people the philosophy has to be in terms of how we engage people rather than how we uh you know exploit people so uh those were really uh you know the key guidelines and you know uh, we we can we can definitely come up with a few more but i think from my experience i felt that if leaders want to bring life into the organizations and start modeling these organizations or enterprises as complex adaptive systems then i think those uh, kind of uh, uh, variables which i mentioned in terms of uh, different mindset and behaviors uh, you know leaders need to follow uh, if 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 they were to treat uh, their system as cash and therefore bring in more agility uh, into the organization so before i conclude you know at this point in time uh, was wondering really if there are any questions that uh, you know people have uh, you know happy to answer any comments you know you want to share any experiences you want to add to the list which uh, uh, you know i i stated out and then i'm willing i'm not willing i'm very keen to learn from uh, you folks in terms of uh, uh, you know your own experiences and perspective on this and feel free to challenge me uh, you know if you think uh, you know you have a counterpoint actually so uh, yeah just uh, let me check Uh, we have a couple of questions here sure yeah let me read that out for you uh, yeah ashish is uh, asking we need to be profitable to continue helping our employees uh, how do we deal mm -hmm. with urgent delivery needs that looks like exploitation but without it we can't survive right so why does urgent delivery become exploitation i think the point is if you engage your employees and if they buy into your purpose you the urgency will emerge from the ground itself because that's the right thing to do for that situation so forcing you know urgency forcing people to you know take time off work weekends work 24 hours a day you know cancel vacations at the last minute right i think these are all symptoms and if somebody is pushing that on to people from outside or from leadership there's a problem i think what has to happen is so for example if you were running your own company right 
if you are engaged with an organization just the way you are running your own company you identify with the purpose you take joy in satisfying your customers you believe that you can add value through your work you know which will impact your customers in a positive way and also help you know the organization that you're working with you will yourself put in that effort right i mean if you are an entrepreneur and if you had to make an urgent delivery is that exploitation no right because it comes from within you and and you work towards that as part of being engaged you know with the customer and with the organization that you serve so obviously uh, when urgency comes uh, the we have to have engagement in uh, the level of engagement has to be such by the people that they take up the urgency themselves rather than it being forced on them if you force something like that obviously it's going to be seen as exploitation but if it comes from within you you know that's a choice that you make and you're making that choice because you are engaged yeah that's that's true so uh, moving on to the next question we have uh, yeah mohit is uh, saying here the customer over shareholders uh, so is that happen in real world yes it does right for example for example if you look at apple right what if you look at their vision mission statements right it is it is it does not say our primary purpose is to maximize shareholder wealth i don't remember those statements now but go and check it out okay it's about coming up with innovative products or something like that it is which is which is you know what they are saying is that we will offer more innovative products to our customers now that is, that is definitely customer oriented statement rather than saying uh, you know i want to make money right so many organizations will have actually their vision mission statements which are customer oriented but they don't behave that way they remain only on paper what i'm talking about is organizations which actually not just put that on paper but behave in a way in which you know they put customers first and i would say companies like you know companies which are doing well for example even amazon uh, uh, you know uh, or or you take apple or any of these new age companies which are actually expanding and thriving and surviving they they are uh, i think you know they are they are working in a way in which they want to put customers first and obviously you know they are generating very high returns for their shareholders in the process so yeah and 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 i think if you want to uh, you know take the example of of a company which uh, uh, and i have experienced this myself because again uh, a disclaimer that i am an employee of this company but thoughtworks is that type of an organization where uh, you know we do put our customers first and shareholder value uh, has has never been uh, you know a motive for us it's always about doing what is the right thing for the customer i mean i can say this uh, you know with uh, uh, you know with conviction from my own experience when when i have felt that you know on a consulting engagement i am not adding value to the customer i have gone back to the customer and said i think you know this is it does not make sense for me to be here i think we have added as much value as you can unless you change this and this and this we don't think we can take you to the next level i think it's better we part right now when you need us again when you move to that level or when you solve these impediments please call us and we'll be back with you right and one customer gave us a compliment saying you don't hang around corridors to pick up crumbs right and that's that's how you know we we have built the credibility with the customer so sorry i'm talking about thought works but i'm speaking from my experience here because you asked that does it happen in real life yes it happens in real life and yes i'm a part of it okay so uh, we can take another question here before moving on to the next part so we have a question here uh, how to derive sprints with a customer who sets target date of delivery when we propose agile backlog instead of uh, deriving full requirement at once in the beginning he says okay i think uh, you know this question is is uh, is is very very specific to software delivery right and i think what you need to understand is what is the problem you are trying to solve and how do you work together uh uh you know in 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 terms of making uh, sure that uh it's it's going to be something which uh, the customer has to work together so uh, if i have understood can you repeat that question pla i think i missed the essence of the question sorry yeah, sure i'm just uh, repeating so the first part is uh, how to derive sprints with a customer who set target date of delivery and then uh, the second part is when we propose agile backlog instead of deriving full requirement at once in the beginning he says okay so that is the total so i i, 
I really don't know. I mean, if I'm understanding the essence of the question, but let me try and under, you know answer it to the best I can. Right? How do you derive spins? Of course, the customer is going to have a timeline, right, by which you know they want something, and of course, the customer is also going to have a budget. But I would suggest that you look up something called as an agile triangle, which Jim Highsmith, uh, you know, my colleague and one of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto wrote about. Uh, so please search for a paper called Adaptive Leadership, written by him, and he talks about the agile triangle. So what that triangle says is that it's not about freezing, you know, time, money, and scope uh, uh, when 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 you're delivering software. You can't do that. Of course, you have to respect the constraint in terms of what time the customer has, and you know how much money they have, and you have to work with the customer to tell them how what is the maximum value you can deliver. Can you prioritize your requirements, and can we deliver the maximum value to you within that period of time? So I think it's a collaborative effort with the customer that has to happen. And I think, yeah, you know, so if the customer is saying, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we are okay to do, uh, you know, detailed requirements later on. That's absolutely fine. You can still derive your sprints, uh, you know, based on high level understanding of requirements. I don't see that as a constraint that you need to understand your requirements in complete detail in order to derive how many sprints. And you do, again, you don't need to know the exact sprint. You can't because software is the nature of software is such that you cannot know anything up front. We have to accept that. I think if you apply traditional engineering principles or manufacturing principles to software, and that's what's been happening, and that's why we run into all these problems, uh, the, you know, you're not going to lead you know, to a very good outcome. So the customer has to be made aware of the assumptions which we are making. And if those assumptions get invalidated, then we have to, you know, uh, you know, work with the customer to find a better solution because I think it's ultimately in the interest of the customer as well as the delivery team, you know, to find a solution which works uh, and which starts giving the customer the value. All right. So. Okay. So uh, I think we can move to the next part, or uh, sure. you want to? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, no, I think we can take questions. I'm going to complete this part and then we can leave it for open for questions as long as uh, you know we can stay on the line. Uh, so, so just to just to uh, conclude on this, right? So when we look at agility, uh, normally agility is looked at in terms of enabling agility or enhancing agility from two perspectives, which is practices and culture, right? So practices are Scrum methodology, XP, etc., stand-ups, retrospectives, unit tests, continuous integration. All those things are practices. And of course, we talk about the mindset and culture of the people and the culture of the organization as well. But I think there is a third element to that and which is modeling it as CAS, right? And, and you know, some of the things which I talked about, uh, uh, you know, that's a, that's a very different mindset uh, other than just being a people-oriented mindset, which is the part of the culture. But there are other dimensions to, uh, you know, culture which uh, fall into the modeling of CAS. And I think if we want to, Truly enhance agility. Uh, it's not just about practices and culture, but it's also about cash modeling uh, of the organization. So, coming back to this point, and I briefly mentioned this that uh, we have modeled organizations as machines, and we have treated them as such. We have treated them uh, like like they are inorganic, like they are fixed. Uh, like if we you know take away one part which is not working we can easily replace that part without impacting something else uh, like it's something which is lifeless but I think what we need to recognize is that uh, you know that's not working for enterprises in terms of why they are not able to deal with change because it's very rigid right a machine is fixed uh, you it, it's neither capable of adapting too much and neither is just capable of responding uh, Organizations are made up of people, and people have life. And you know, there is a, an element of uh, organicness, uh, you know, in an organization, which, in terms of it having life. And I think we need to look at organizations uh, as something which which has life, just like an economy has life. Uh, you know, traffic has life in it. Uh, a jungle has life in it, and of course, people have life. So if you look at all the natural and socio-economic systems, they have some life, which which makes them operate. And uh, you know they are able to respond and adapt to uh, you know circumstances and the agents. So we need to look at, at uh, enterprises also or organizations also in a similar way. And I just want to conclude with this slide by Peter Senge, you know, who said that living systems have integrity, uh, you know, and they, their character depends on the whole. So it's not like a machine, you know, you have to look at it holistically and systemically, which means that they have life. And he said that the same is true for organizations and. Uh, 
that's 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 really the key takeaway that that we need to look at is that organizations have life uh, we have not treated them like that uh, we have treated them like closed ended systems but i think in a fast changing environment in case you know you want agility uh, uh, then then they will need to be modeled like complex adaptive systems and why complex adaptive systems because complex adaptive systems have shown uh, that they have agility and they have proven their agility uh, you know over periods of time over uh, over all these years um, from from the time that you know they they came into existence right so that's it from me um, thank you So questions. Yes, uh, we can now uh, take care of a few more questions. So he, uh, here we have a question. Pallav is asking, what is the best way to build customer trust in a short period of time? Uh, there are no shortcuts, I think, on some things, right? Trust is something which, which takes time to build. But I think the, the key thing is, are you... Empathy, I think, is 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 very essential, uh, you know, for building trust. And I think if if you really display good understanding of the customer true needs and requirements, if you build, uh, you know, relationships. So it depends. I mean, you know, if it's a customer which, uh, uh, you know, you are engaging as a sample, then then you know, deriving learnings from from working with that sample or getting feedback from that. But if it's an institutional customer, then how do you connect with those people? How do you understand their true needs? how you give them the confidence and the belief that it is their interest which is primary in your mind and i think uh, you know uh, that's and 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 that that the word spreads actually uh, you know through your actions and and uh, that's how you build trust is is uh, through empathy through showing uh, the customer in 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 not just words but in actions that you care about them uh, and that their interest is the first thing that you are thinking about uh, Definitely, trust gets built, uh, you know, between the customer and uh, the service providing organization or the product organization. Okay, uh, moving on to the next question. Here we have: uh, What an organization need to invest to change mindset to agile mindset? Like, I hope he wanted to say traditional to the agile mindset thing, traditional project. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you know it all has to start with uh, the need to recognize that we need to do things differently okay and that recognition has to happen at the leadership level itself unless the leaders you know are are uh, not embracing uh, you know the newer ways of working or the newer mindset that's not going to percolate and again it's it's clearly about recognizing the need that what has worked in the past is not going to work uh, and and uh, how can we be prepared, uh, you know, to take on change better? So that radical shift in, in in mindset, you know, has to happen. And again, it's possible. It is very much possible. Like for example, again, I come from a banking background, so I often give banking examples because that's what I track. ING Bank, which is like one of the world's biggest banks, they realized, uh, you know, that the whole banking industry is under threat, and they adopted agility. And today, you know, it has made a difference to their business outcomes. So I think. Clearly, you you need to understand why you are changing. You need to be convinced about it, and then you need to commit to it fully, uh, uh, and and not just half-hearted way. What we often see is leaders want people on the ground to change, but they continue with their old behaviors. Uh, obviously, that's not going to work, and uh, you know but that will never sustain. So it has to be an initiative which uh, uh, which which has to be embraced by uh, the senior leadership. The reasons for the change have to be convincing, and throughout the organizations, those reasons have to, uh, you know, be shared. Again, there is an element of involvement, transparency, uh, and and sharing with people, get taking people along the journey with you. Uh, I think those are the really the keys to changing the mindset. But it has to start right at the top, uh, and and then that enables, uh, you know, that change to happen uh, throughout the rest of the enterprise. Okay, should I move to the next question? Yes, please. So next we have a good business analyst uh, take their career to product owner or product manager. 
So I think this question is out of context, but let me answer that. Yeah. I mean, I would say why not? Well, what's stopping it, right? So uh, your binary, uh, uh, you know, answer is, is yes. I mean, I mean what, what's, what stops it? So uh, anybody can take their career to any level. I mean, you know, I have a colleague who, who was previously a medical doctor who, uh, you know, became a business analyst and who do, now became a software developer and he's championing a technology within ThoughtWorks completely globally, right? So there is no reason. I think you need to find an organization which is willing to recognize your underlying passion and your underlying talent. It's not about skills. Uh, you know, it's about capabilities uh, and, and capabilities consist of knowledge and experience, uh, your innate abilities like analytical skills or do you have good interpersonal skills? Uh, you know, do you have good problem solving skills? Uh, and of course, you know, some some specific skills needed for for that role. And it's a combination of this which makes capabilities. And, uh, you know, human beings are very resilient people. We adapt to newer circumstances. And if somebody is passionate about doing something else, why business analyst? You can become from a business analyst to a developer or from a developer to a business analyst. And I have live examples with whom I work with, uh, you know, uh, who have made those drastic changes in those career. So, yeah. So product owner, product manager. Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a logical move. Yeah, that's very, very uh, well said uh, by you, Sunil. Very nicely said. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So uh, next uh, one question we have. So it starts like that. This will need an organization culture change. How do you bring about that change in the most effective way? Which model you prefer the most? All right. So I think I've answered this question, you know, in my previous to previous response by saying that, you know, you really need to understand, uh, you know, and be convinced about the need for changing your culture. You have to understand what is working well in your culture, because if you are a surviving enterprise, then, uh, you know, you, you know, some things definitely would be working well for you. And you have to understand what's hindering, you know, the ability of the organization or what's putting the organization at risk uh, in terms of not able to change. Um, and again, you know, culture and mindset has to be, uh, uh, you know, the the um, uh, the uh, the primary uh, foundational uh, layers that you need to change. But just by changing culture, mindset, you know, it's it's not something which uh, uh, you know will enable everything. You have to look at structure. You have to look at processes. So again, you're looking at different aspect of the organization and say what are those things or what are those impediments which is causing the organization to slow down or not being responsive and adaptive to customers and i think changing about that and that's precisely what i'm writing about in my book folks i can't uh, you know in the short period of time that i have uh, uh, you know talk about it in detail but you would have to wait to, to read my book and the book is about uh, enterprise agility enhancing agility in the new era and the approach that I'm taking is that you need to change things at multiple levels. Uh, you need to change things at the foundational level and you need to change things at, uh, at, at, at different, you know, elements of the organization. So people, process, governance, structure, uh, your approach to your customer, all, all that, you know, you will need to change. And what I've shared in the book is some patterns which I have seen work in terms of enhancing agility. But I think you, you need to have, uh, you know, all this tied up with a, a proper, uh, vision mission statement uh, have a purposeful vision mission statement that's you know the primary thing that you would need to change I think if you are saying that I will change only to make more money from my shareholders uh, definitely you're not going to get any engagement uh, you know from your customers and employees believe me if, if that's going to be yeah sure I mean you can do something on paper but you have to behave that way and believe that you need to behave differently uh, with an inclusive approach and with an approach to engage with all the stakeholders and once that's done uh, you need to look at what are your strengths, what are your areas of weaknesses, what are the levers which are important to you for an organization. So for some ex organizations, time to market uh, will be more important for some. Maybe, you know, uh, efficiency is more important uh, and quality is more important. Uh, and, and based on that, you know, how do you leverage the organization uh, to, uh, to, to align itself uh, in all ways? To those outcomes that you expect uh, which which will help you thrive and survive in a changing environment 
you know that's going to be specific to very every organization and you have to make trade-offs you cannot say i want quality i want speed to market i want efficiency i want effectiveness uh, and and i want happy employees and i want happy customers and uh, i want to save money also uh, and you know those kind of things so there will be trade-offs which uh, which you need to make and those trade-offs have to be very conscious uh, and based on those trade-offs, based on your strengths, and based on the gap that you see between your current state and the envisioned future state, you need to come up with a plan uh, to implement, uh, you know, the transformation. So that's the kind of approach that I would be suggesting in my book, uh, and that's the approach that I've actually taken with organizations when I put them on the path to enhance agility. So I think we are past nine, yeah. uh, and um, while I'm happy to take question more but i think let's be conscious of time for all our participants as well uh, and uh, you know uh, if if there's something that i can answer right away uh, if there's a very interesting question i can take it now otherwise uh, please wait for my book uh, so, yeah so people are uh, asking multiple people uh, when the book is getting published what's the name of the book and it's already a big hit yeah <laughs> people are interested mm -hmm. about you very much for the conference. so the book is going to be published sometime uh end june beginning of july and uh, the title you know I'm, I'm still yet to fully fully freeze it but the tentative title as of now is enterprise agility that's the title and the subtitle is enhancing agility in the new era um so and then, then the publisher has actually announced the book on on amazon uh but but yeah you know uh, it, it it's still a few months away before it it's finally launched so okay so yeah we have uh, come to the end of the session thanks all for uh, joining and uh, from this session you can uh, claim one seu and one pdu all these informations uh, the steps of claiming the seus and pdus uh, you will get it in next uh, one hour and uh, if you have any specific query regarding the session uh, do post in our discussion forum of uh, discuss agile network you can uh, see the thread uh, like the link you will uh, get in the email itself and uh, our next webinar is on 14th of feb and uh, the speaker will be saket bansal topic is a bit different uh, this time emotional intelligence in practice so I'm uh, hoping many of you will be there. And uh, yes, that's all from my side. Thank you, Sunil. Thanks uh, for your time. And thank you all for joining once again. Good night.